Thank you for listening to this forum podcast. Please check out our website for a rich archive of podcasts and writing from contemporary philosophers and other researchers on a wide variety of topics. The Forum is an educational charity dedicated to bringing academic philosophy to a broader audience. Please consider donating to us via our Just Giving page, which you can find on our website. Happy listening. Thank you so much, Beth, for such a warm introduction and sort of a promissory note for magic, I guess. So I'll try and bring some of that. Um, And thanks to all of you for coming. So reason uh, is obviously at the core of much philosophical thinking. Philosophers give reasons, they search for reasons, and they try to understand the reasons underpinning their rivals' positions. Reason itself is also a defining element of certain approaches to philosophy. Kant's famous book, The Critique of Pure Reason, is interested in how much philosophy can be done by pure reason alone, and the extent to which reason can account for all things. Rationalist philosophy, which emphasises the strong prospects for a reasons-focused approach, has often been contrasted with empiricism, which focuses on experience instead. These positions offer rival accounts of knowledge and have hugely and probably problematically shaped the way we teach and organise the history of philosophy and its principal thinkers. So this evening we'll have a look at these more historical ways of thinking about reason. In more recent times, reason and its merits have found their way into the centre of philosophical thinking again. Discussion of the importance of reason and logic has become a kind of politics of its own, especially when it's considered in opposition to thinking that is more sensitive to historical context, emotionality and structure. So we'll also take some time to consider the origins of this kind of thinking and to what extent it's a respectable extension of the reason-focused philosophy of the past. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our eminently reasonable panelists. Uh, Alex Douglas is a lecturer in philosophy in the School of Philosophical, Anthropological and Film Studies at the University of St. Andrews. His research interests are early modern rationalism, of the hardcore variety I understand, history of logic and the philosophy of debt. Kirsten Walsh is an assistant professor in the philosophy department at Nottingham University, uh, though she's soon to move to the University of Exeter. Her primary interests are Newton's philosophical methodology, the emergence of experimental philosophy, and many other things I'm sure we'll get to this <laughs> evening. Peter Milken is Gilbert Royal Fellow and Professor of Philosophy at Hartford College at Oxford. He works on many aspects of David Hume's philosophical thought and also issues in computing and philosophy, and is also very good at chess. Um, okay, so I thought maybe we could start some, with some sort of historical grounding in how reason becomes a central topic in philosophy in the early modern period. Um, so Alex, the topic is reason. I think we should start in this historical way. Would you mind telling us a bit about the role of reason and theorising about it in these early stages of what we call modern philosophy? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you very much to Claire and to Beth for the invitation, the organisation of this event, and to all of you for coming out here. Um, the early modern period, I guess, is a, a period when people are trying to find new foundations for philosophy. For various reasons, the philosophy of previous eras was regarded as somehow having become decadent. Um, and there's a narrative that, that there was these sort of two rival candidates for what the foundation of philosophical thought was going to be, that there was one group that said it should be the knowledge that we have from the senses, and there was another group that, it should, that said it should be something else. Um, that's a problematic way of looking at the, the history for various reasons, which I'm sure Kirsten will tell us about. But there was also a lot of discussion of what reasoning is, what we do when we reason. Um, so Hobbes has this, this famous line that reasoning is but reckoning. By reckoning, he just means something like calculation. So when you reason, you just do the same sort of thing as when you add up numbers. You have these various rules that you know how to follow for adding up numbers, and you get a result. And when you reason, you somehow do the same thing with concepts, although Hobbes never explained how that worked. Um, I mean, the, the idea was sufficiently compelling that Leibniz tried to, tried to work out an actual way of doing this. So he thought you take a concept, you associate it with a number, and then the mathematical factors of that number will be the concepts that go together to compose the bigger concept or something like that. What kind of concepts would he have in mind there? Or? So, for example, the number corresponding to the concept for human would have among its factors the numbers corresponding to the concepts of rational and animal. Um, so, you, you know, 
Of course, the, the only reason that works is because you set it up that way, right? Like, if you, if you know what, how you want the concepts to go together, then you set them up with the right numbers so that they... It's not like by thinking about numbers you, you can actually learn anything. So the question was, yes, there are all these mechanical devices we can employ to track the way we reason, but Descartes, for example, makes a very compelling argument, I think, in the rules of the direction of the mind, that all of these, these different logical procedures that we use, we only know that those are the right ones to use because we have some other way of knowing what's actually reasonable. We have some way of knowing how we can work out logical consequences just by thinking about them. And Descartes refers to, to this as intellectual intuition. So for example, if I think about, if I just think about it, I don't need to use any sensory experiences, I don't need to do any experiments, if I just think about it, I can work out that if something's red all over, that it's not also green all over. I don't, I don't need to, to do anything besides think. I just, I just sort of intuit that. Philosophy has always been very uncomfortable with that idea. I mean, there's always been discomfort around this, this idea of intellectual intuition. Various philosophers have tried to, to get away from this notion. I'm not sure where the discomfort comes from. But maybe it seems sort of supernatural <coughs> somehow that your mind can just get this information. Uh, how does the information then get into the mind? At least with sensory experiences, you can tell a story, but you know, it's a kind of, but, yeah, I'll, I'll end. <laughs> okay, and so I suppose one thing people tend to think about <coughs> those philosophers who really like reason in this period is that they see a certain sort of methodological safety in it. Could you speak a bit to why many of those thinkers are saying, look, if we want reliable results or a true philosophy, we go with reason instead of experience, or...? Um, well, Descartes has various arguments about why the senses can be misleading in all of these different ways. I mean, these aren't hard to come up with. You have sensory experiences when you're dreaming, at least he did. I take it not everybody does. Um, so, you know, we, we already have one example where we, we all agree that having sensory experiences doesn't uh, equal having reliable knowledge. Whereas things like knowing that 2 plus 2 equals 4, or that something can't be red all over and green all over, you know, there it seems like there's, there's some kind of guarantee of certainty that comes built in to the very result. So if you could, the more you can get philosophically from doing that, the more you can learn about the world by just appealing to pure reason, the more reliable the, the final picture you're going to have will be. Kristen, maybe you could tell us a bit about how this becomes a sort of uh, defining point of two sort of ideologies or two ways of thinking about this period of philosophy. Sure. So is that... Yeah, that's about right, isn't it? Yeah. Good. I like to think of this as philosophy's self-constructed narrative. Um, I think... Uh, so, so rationalism, which is what uh, Alex has just described, um, was juxtaposed with empiricism in the early modern period. Um, and... What's interesting, what's really important about these two terms is that um, these are not actors' categories. These are not terms that were kind of in use by the philosophers themselves at this time. And so this is why I tend to think of it as a self-constructed narrative. This is a story that philosophers have um, come up with themselves to make sense of their past. And so on this picture, we've got rationalism on the one hand, and this is the... Um, Broadly speaking, the doctrine that knowledge of the external world can be acquired a priori, um, and as Alex said, um, that this is generally, rationalists think that um, this kind of knowledge that's acquired um, before experience um, is superior to any knowledge that's provided um, by sensory experience, that our senses kind of deceive us in some way. Um, but reason will always win out, is the thought. Um, and so this is characterised by the doctrine of innate ideas, that we've got these concepts that are already in our minds. Um, and the thought is that because these are innate, um, there are universal concepts. So everybody has these same concepts. They're born with them. Um, in con so what's the theory of where they come from? I mean, where, where do people... Why is it that rationalists are so attracted to innate ideas? Uh, someone else might be able to uh, answer this better than I do. God puts them there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, certainly in the, in the case of idea, the idea of God and the idea of uh, extension, which is the, our innate idea of, uh, uh, of matter, uh, Descartes is going to say that 
God put it there, and that's how, why we can know a priori about it. Okay, so if you believe in God, that's going to be another well, everybody place does getting then, safety. Almost, yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. it doesn't matter so much what the origin of the innate ideas is in some way. There's something about the fact that we can conceptualise things that we couldn't possibly encounter in experience. So for Descartes, I think the parade case is just the idea of infinity. Right. Not, not only can we think about um, the idea of, of an infinitely sized object or an infinitely powerful being or in, uh, you know, the number of natural numbers, it has, has to be an infinite number, um, you know, it turns out we can reason about it and, and prove things about that. We can't possibly have learned that by looking at everything. But it seems even Descartes has a funny way of saying that we would cognize that idea, right? It's some metaphor of you can't hug the mountain, you can only touch it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. I think it was, it was in the, he says, though the infinity, it's, it's an idea you could never fully enclose your mind around, you can't understand everything oh, in yeah, it. Oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you, you can't entirely grasp it, but the point is, you can't, you certainly can't assemble the idea from things that you've learned from experience. This is a debate that he ends up, uh, well, Locke, who's an empiricist philosopher, ends up challenging that, by saying, well, why can't you just sort of you know, think about a field, and then the field comes to an end, and then you take away from that idea the idea that it comes to an end. Like, why isn't that? Um, Descartes has various things to say about why that's not going to work. That doesn't get you to the concept. Okay, so maybe from Locke back through to the empiricist, then, or what's the sort of the stereotype there? Right. Yeah. So, so on the other hand, we have the empiricists, and they think that external world truths uh, can only be known a posteriori. So, after experience. Um, you remind me of what a posteriori. After, after experience, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so the idea is that, um, that any knowledge that we have of the world has to be dependent on our experience of the world, on our sense experience. Um, and this involves a rejection of innate ideas. Um, the idea is that everything we, every concept we have has got to come from, from the world, from our senses. Um, and so this is, this is roughly the division, and so usually the division is characterised as a division between the British empiricists on the one hand, uh, so we've got Bacon who's known as Francis Bacon who's the father of empiricism, um, and so then we've got Locke, Berkeley, Hume, uh, they're the sort of canonical empiricist philosophers, uh, and then on the other hand we've got the continental rationalists, uh, and so Descartes is usually thought of as being the father of rationalism, um, and so we've got Descartes, Spinoza and Leibniz are the kind of canonical uh, rationalists. Um, and so the, this, this framework is, well, this, this picture is kind of um, the idea that uh, successive figures developed uh, their ideas, their, uh, developed their kind of um, assumptions about the nature of knowledge um, uh, based on the positions um, character, uh, identified by their predecessors. And so, um, and they end up kind of, um, each side of this division kind of really reject the ideas of the of the, um, or they reject the central ideas of the opposing camp. And so we've got very much this kind of, um, there's a boundary between the two sides and they kind of, all the major debates going on in early modern philosophy um, are going on um, uh, along these two, uh, in, in these two camps is the idea. And so they're kind of two separate dialectically opposed progressions of ideas. And so then we're told that this back and forth these characterising these two positions kind of finally comes to an end when Kant uh, steps in with his great critical philosophy. Um, he kind of carries out this great synthesis of the two, of the uh, of the best bits of rationalism and the best bits of empiricism, um, and brings the early modern period to a close. Is the idea. Um, and what's interesting is that this kind of framework domin really dominates early modern studies. So it both pedagogically um, and also in terms of the research that's being. Covered. Traditionally, it really has kind of dominated all of the the ways that we teach. We tend to teach, you know, the course on the British empiricists, where we teach, you know, Locke, Berkeley, Hume, and we teach the continental rationalists, and so on. And we, yeah, this is, tends to be how we frame everything. And do you think people? I mean, it's something I've seen. I feel in teaching is that people do. Use, there's something in the approaches that is significantly different that means that students tend to prefer thinkers of one camp and thinkers of another camp? Do know, does that resonate with your experience at all? Yeah, I think it is. I mean, uh, as, as will come become clearer, I'm, or may, maybe it's already become clear to you, I, I don't, I, I'm very skeptical of this framework. I don't think it's very helpful to us. Um, and I think it's very problematic when we teach students um, if this is their first uh, presentation of early modern philosophy. Um, I think it introduces a lot of biases 
in terms of how they understand uh, philosophical developments in this time period. Um, they, for, for one thing, uh, I think this, this framework introduces um, kind of an epistemological bias. Um, it, it, gives this, it gives the students this, this idea that the, major, that the major debate that's going on in early modern philosophy, the major source of progress um, uh, is in terms of kind of fundamental well, questions about kind of the foundations of knowledge, first person epistemology. Um, and we're told that, that this is kind of the major thing that, that everyone is debating about, uh, which just isn't the case at this time. Um, it also overemphasizes the extent to which um, Kant was important in bringing the early modern period to a close. Um, <laughs> and it also overemphasizes the extent to which uh, early modern philosophies, ph philosophers could really be divided into these two camps. Um, I and mean, we were talking back in the green room um, about this, about, about you know, we, this, on this traditional framework, we divide up um, the British empiricists and the continental rationalists, but, um, uh, but, as, but as you were saying, Peter, um, you know, um, it looks like we can carve up things very differently and we can, we, we can kind of make... Um, well, you, you uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I get the example of, of Barclay and Malebranche. Uh, Barclay is you know, put in the empiricist camp and Malebranche who was a Cartesian, certainly, but uh, uh, he's put in the rationalist camp. But actually, Barclay and Malebranche, if you want to take two great philosophers who in many ways are very, very similar, uh, I think that they have much more in common with each other than, say, Barclay does with Locke. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty misleading. I think maybe once you move back from that epistemological focus, you get more of a sense of the kind of the richness of the thinkers and that there's a lot more connections that are possible to make. Is that yes, it? yeah. I, I think Kirsten's right about this epistemological bias and the first person bias in particular that comes from Descartes. Uh, that actually has a lot of impact in how people can now read uh, the other philosophers. I think when students come to Hume, for example, they're naturally inclined to read his sceptical uh, discussions in that light. And, and sometimes that's misleading. Sometimes it's better to see things in a somewhat different way. This is kind of jumping ahead a bit, but I'll, I'll just amplify what I mean. Descartes famously starts his meditations with uh, a sceptical discussion in, in the first meditation. How do I know I'm not dreaming? How do I know I'm not being deceived by an evil demon? Uh, what I must do in order to establish knowledge is to find a foundation so secure that it can refute all these sceptical worries. So Descartes is effectively saying, well, Mr. Skeptic, if I can't refute you, you win. And actually, I think with Hume, who's famously sceptical as well, but I think there, to understand Hume correctly, you have to see particularly his later, uh, later work, rather differently, where he says, actually, Mr. Skeptic, why should I give you the victory if you can't persuade me? So I think this, this, uh, this assumption of Cartesian skepticism underlying the period is quite, quite damaging. But um, sh shall I say a bit more to, about... Sure, I guess because Nat Hume has a lot to say about all of the stuff. That yeah, yeah, he does, them. indeed. <laughs> I mean... I, it, it's very interesting. The, the, I suspect that the, the rationalist empiricist thing has become so popular partly because of some kind of coincidences. I mean, you've got the British continental thing. Uh, you've got the fact that on the rationalist side, you've got people like uh, Descartes and Leibniz, who are really great mathematicians and scientists, hugely impressed by what you can do with mathematics. And, uh, and as Alex was saying, when you're searching for new foundations, the, the medieval worldview has collapsed. The Aristotelian theory of the universe has been shown to be rubbish because Galileo looked up at the sky with his telescope and found that actually the Earth is not the centre of the universe, so the Aristotelian physics goes out of the window. And then you've got a, a load of really great thinkers applying mathematics and, and discovering important things. I mean, Descartes... Uh, discovers Cartesian coordinates, you know, the X and Y coordinates that you learn at school, and is able to do all sorts of wonderful things with that. He analyzes the rainbow and so forth. So th th I think the, the, the enthusiasm for reason has, has a very solid basis there. Now, if you, if you take thinkers like Locke and Hume, they're more interested in social and political and moral things. 
and where mathematics plays less of a role. So, you know, it's not surprising that there's, there's less of a, um, a rationalist focus there. I mean, another point I want to take up on, on Kirsten drew out two aspects of the distinction between rationalism and empiricism. One is to do with what we can know, and one is to do with where our ideas come from. And it's natural to assume that those go together, but they needn't. Um, it would be, it's possible for us to have ideas that we get from experience, for example, to take a traditional, rather antiquated philosophical example, the idea of a bachelor, <laughs> unmarried man, yes. <laughs> the, the, and you can know a priori, without any empirical investigation, that all bachelors are unmarried. Okay. So the idea is one we get from experience. You couldn't possibly have the idea of a man or the idea of marriage without experience. But having got that idea, we can know some things a priori about it simply by examining, as they would say, our idea of it. Um, so it's quite possible to claim that we can have a priori knowledge about ideas that come from experience. But um, and the, the sort of caricature of British empiricists and continental rationalists particularly goes wrong, I think, when you get to questions about God. I mean, Locke thought that you could prove a priori the existence of God, or in what I would call an a prioristic way. He's got a kind of cosmological argument for the existence of God, which seems very out of line with what you'd think the typical empiricist to be doing. Um, so, it, it's, although it's true that Hume in particular follows Locke very much when it comes to the origin of ideas. So Locke argues that all our ideas come from experience, and he's very keen to argue that against Descartes. Hume comes along and follows Locke in that. Yes, yes, all our ideas come from experience. They're all kind of copies of what he calls impressions. They're all copies of sensations or feelings. That's how we get all our ideas. Um, Locke, as I say, has a, ra a rationalist side, whereas Hume doesn't. Hume is the, the one philosopher of the period who absolutely wants to insist that the only way we can know anything about the world is by experience. Um, so anyway, uh, as Kirsten was saying, the, 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 the rationalist empiricist story fitted Kant very nicely. So Immanuel Kant uh, styled himself as bringing these two traditions together as it were, getting the best of both of them. And I, Hegel is often reckoned to have played a role here as, uh, uh, as well, because Hegel was very fond of a thesis and antithesis and a synthesis, so you get the two different points of view streaming together, and Kant kind of forms from these a synthesis uh, that achieves more than either of the two. And then, of course, Hegel comes and puts the icing on the cake. I just want to say a little word about that. I mean, Kant's, uh, sometimes with my tongue a little bit in my cheek, I like to say that a far more reliable categorization of the philosophers of the early modern period is dogmatic rationalists on the one hand and skeptical empiricists on the other. Dogmatic rationalists, Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, Malebranche, etc., Locke, Berkeley, and Kant. Were you just adding me to the list? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would definitely go on the dogma of rationalist part. On the other side, Hume. <laughs> oh, as a whole. <laughs> Short list. So, no, well, well, Kant, you see, what Kant wanted to do was sh actually show that we could have a priori knowledge of the world, what he called synthetic a priori knowledge. And the way... So he, he, he saw Hume as the massive challenge, because Hume was saying... You can't know anything about the world a priori. Only, only things about our own concepts and maths and such like. Kant's ingenious solution is to say, no, we can know things a priori about the world because the world is partly mind-constructed. And that's an idea that he got sort of from Berkeley. Um, so, so he actually is trying to go back, I think, in a rationalist direction having been exposed to Hume's challenge. Um, briefly, I don't think it can possibly work unless you can find a way of knowing a priori about how the mind is going to construct the world. The fact that my mind constructs the world, suppose that's true, that doesn't imply that I can know a priori in advance of experience 
how my mind will construct it. So I don't think Kant actually provides a solution there. Um, but we can go on. And I'm, I'm just <laughs> curious to return to something you spoke about a moment ago, which was the role of God in all of this. So mm. as, as you were saying, it's not a period where it's very easy to be, you know, much less atheist, but even non-standard in your theism in this period. I think there's a way of understanding parts of rationalism, maybe, that you know, the principle of sufficient reason or as a feeling that the world must be intelligible and a way of connecting that to thinking about God. And also maybe to Kirsten in a minute, because Newton is, you know, the, the king of science in the period, but not a, not a sort of scientistic atheist of any kind, right, but somebody with... No, I mean, a lot of his work is theology. Yeah, yeah so th maybe discuss the role of God for a minute, or...? I mean, the, there's, there's a motivation that, I guess, appeals to people like Descartes and Spinoza that the universe has to be, to some degree, intelligible, because the thesis that the universe is unintelligible just refutes itself, right? That, that, that claim itself would then be something we couldn't understand. Or any reasoning that you use to arrive at such a conclusion wouldn't have any justification, because uh, even the laws of logic wouldn't apply in, in, a, in a perfectly um, unintelligible universe. So, um, what about a half unintelligible universe? Yeah, well, just to, to some degree, right? So, so the, the thought there is that to some degree there has to be. Girl down. Um, yeah, oh, I didn't start, I started off with them. Um, I, can, I, can get, I, can get, I can get to. <laughs> um, you know, that, that, that's the Archimedean point you need to then move the rest of the universe. But, the, but I, so, so for Spinoza, um, there are at least principles of inference that need to be to hold universally with kind of absolute certainty. Um, just by trying to think about the issue, you realise there's no other possibility, right? The, the opposite conclusion refutes itself, and that Spinoza identifies in some way with belief in God, at least in his sense, because he, think, he thinks that to, to perceive that uh, rational orderliness in the universe, to, to perceive the universality of uh, the laws of reasoning is, is, already, is, is in some sense already to perceive what, what he regards as God. Descartes, of course, is different, but not, maybe not so different. Um, Any thoughts on this? We might come into some Q&A. Well, it, yeah, it, the only major philosopher of that period who pretty much certainly doesn't believe in God is, is David Hume. And the, there may have been others, uh, but they tended to be prudently not announce it too clearly. I mean, I think with Hume, it's pretty clear he doesn't believe in God, but you have to read his texts quite carefully uh, to get that message coming through. So he doesn't believe uh, in a universe that is uh, benevolently designed, because um, he, he doesn't, Darwin hasn't come along then, so it's not like he's got a, 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 a modern, no, he, he, ha he hasn't got an explanation for why things fit in the way they apparently do. Um, but it does have quite a profound effect on his philosophy, I think. Whereas, I mean, Locke and um, Berkeley, although they, uh, they're obviously not rationalists in the way that uh, Descartes and Spinoza are, uh, they do have, you know, God, God fits into their worldview pretty well, especially to Berkeley. He's an absolutely integral part of it. Can I actually just say one more? Oh, sorry, um, I mean, I've got I've got lots of questions about about human God, but I don't think that this is the right time. So, yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, I, I guess I um, the sort of thing that impresses Descartes, for example. So, I mean, it's absolutely right that De Descartes writes a letter in um, I think 1646 saying, "I don't want to do anything but experiments uh, from now on." So he's clearly not, you know, a rationalist in, in the sense of these sort of historians' categories that get employed much. He's not somebody who thinks that you learn about the world by sitting around just thinking about stuff. Um, but I suppose the, sort of, the sorts of things that impress him are the degree to which ideas that we do have just through contemplation, for example, mathematical ideas, apply with amazing um, consistency to the world we experience. So, of course, Descartes was the person who realised that you can map patterns in space by mathematical functions. Um, but, you know, why? A mathematical function is an abstract object. Why should that have any connection to the ways that things move through space? Um, 
Uh, you know, if you throw an object, it falls in a parabola. A parabola is a really nice, neat, simple mathematical function. Why? Why should that be? Um, so that's, I, I guess, already a motivation for theism of some sort, at least for for Descartes. That, that's the fact that you can't you can't easily explain, he thought, without appeal to, to some notion of design. So it's much deeper than um, you know the sort of beauty of nature or the orderliness of um, of creation, but. Um, what's something else I was going to say about this? Oh, right. So, I mean, I, I guess Kant maybe, as traditionally interpreted, comes up with an alternative explanation, which is, well, the reason that these ideas that we just have sort of abstractly through abstract thought apply to the world of experience is because we construct the world of experience. So one in the same mind is, is doing the work there. But until then, I mean, unless, unless you want to take that step, I guess. Um, it's, it's, Seems a good note to try and take some questions. Does anyone have... Yes, I have one. Could we just wait for the microphone to come uh, so it'll be on the podcast? In the event of AI becoming equal to human brain, do you think it will be an empiricist or a rationalist? <laughs> <laughs> that is an absolutely excellent question. I'm going to take them in batches and let the panel respond as they are. All right, so. I'm just um, curious as to where these debates happen in the other sort of philosophical schools around the world, the Islamic world. And then maybe one more here. So I'm intrigued about Kant to some extent, and, and that is this thing about the a priori knowledge. If that's a mind constructed thing, then isn't that a form of experience that one gets? And over time, one tends to build models and construct some sort of intuition towards it, and then one feels that that is a priori, but really it is constructed. Okay, thank you so much. So, just the three questions to see if he wants to jump in. Where um, will the the AI that equals human on capacity be rationalist or empiricist? It's a great question. Uh, are there in other uh, non just the Western canon in traditions other than that? Do you see anything like the carving up that we see along these lines? And then Kant intuition and the yeah, right, right, right. Okay. Sure. And it's non existence. <laughs> I want to jump in on the AI <laughs> question. Surely this is just the wrong way of even dividing up um, how things would would go. I mean, I don't I wouldn't expect um, our future AIs to have um, to have so much a theory of knowledge, but some sort of methodology, some some way of acquiring information about the world and some way of kind of developing new theories and so on. Um, and so I would I, I would say that um, this is sort of preempt to probably to preempt myself in the next section. But I would expect our AI to be much more of a kind of experimental philosopher rather than characterising them as an empiricist or a rationalist. But I don't know what you guys think about that. I think that uh, AI Descartes would say couldn't be capable of reasoning in the sense of what he thinks reasoning is. Because so one view of what reasoning is is you can demystify reasoning if you reduce it to the simple application of specific rules. So, you know, one theory of mathematics is that all you're doing is you have some axioms and then you, you apply very um, clear <coughs> rules to those axioms and you generate things like the number series. But Descartes would say, no, it's, it, it, does not, it cannot work like that. What happens is we rationally intuit, we intellectually intuit these abstract objects called numbers and then we build this system that tries to copy the structure of the thing that we've glimpsed in this in this intuition, um, so that the computer at best could, you know, implement the systems that we've built to try to track out our rational intuition, our intellectual intuitions, but it couldn't have intellectual intuitions. Um, yeah, interesting. Yeah, I, I'm speculating about what a future artificial intelligence will be like is quite problematic. Um, particularly if you say if artificial intelligence could get to human levels, if you mean thinking like a human, um, I don't think that's going to happen in the lifetime of anyone here. If you mean doing thinking about particular domains as effectively or more effectively than a human, well, you can already do that, I and mean, chess being an example, uh, but there are plenty of others. I don't, the rationalist empiricist kind of dichotomy, I think, as, as we all think, is something of a mistake, really. Um, you, you can apply it 
when it, when it comes to AI, you, you could say things like this. Are the most successful artificial intelligence systems going to be ones which operate with uh, concepts and categories that have been built into them from the start? That would be like you know, an innate idea. Or are they going to discover them for themselves? And my guess is that will depend on the domain. Uh, if you're dealing with domains where humans are already very good at doing things, then maybe building our categories into them would be a, a good thing to do. Because deep learning has been tremendously successful in recent years. Uh, because there you've got computer systems that are actually able to, if you like, create their own concepts by, by finding networks of information that we're unable to discern. Um, so it, th there isn't an easy answer to the question, except to say probably that it won't be either, really. Uh, it'll mi mix the best bits of both. My question was not entirely serious, but the, it arose from the fact that as an engineer I was thinking that if one could, um, if someone, uh, find somebody who had a young child, maybe even, who had not been exposed to any worldly experience, then might it then be possible by a brain scan to determine whether uh, rational thought without experience was present in the brain? Were the neurons firing in a particular way that might suggest that? Um, and so I extended from that into the idea of AI, in which one might have a much greater degree of control than one would have over finding such a subject. Thank you. On that response, or either to the we, we question of yeah. international or the more different schools and the history of philosophy, and I suppose the availability of that material has been a bit less sustained in, in the West. Yeah, I, I, I wish I knew more about the kinds of debates that were going on in other cultures around this time. I, I, I know more about, I mean, I, I don't know very much about even the science side of this, but um, I, yeah, I think in, in other in other philosophical cultures, you do find uh, thinkers who tend more towards one side or the other. I mean, the arguments, for example, trying to prove the existence of God are not purely Western. Discussions of, I mean, you know, Indian philosophy, ha there are some schools there that have discussions that are interestingly like Hume's on things like personal identity and... Uh, apparently informed by similar kind of thinking. So I think you do get uh, you, you do get a lot of uh, resonances there. I think what, what's particularly important about the 17th and 18th century though is the scientific revolution and the, that history um, wasn't played out in quite that way anywhere else as far as I know. And so there have been you know, great mathematical discoveries made in other countries, in other cultures. But the scientific revolution which drove all this was, I think, very much a European phenomenon. Yeah. I mean, I am... Um, I'm just... I, I, again, speak from no expertise on this, but it, it, it is interesting and has been noted by historians of philosophy that um, the people incorrectly called continental rationalists, most of the arguments used, the famous arguments used there, you can find precedence in, particularly in um, writings from the Islamic world, from around the 11th and 12th centuries. And there's interesting questions you can ask about why that, that is, but you know, one thing is um, both philosophers like Descartes and Leibniz um, and philosophers from the Islamic world of that period were very, very interested in mathematics and sort of in the same mathematics, um, algebra, you know, algebra is an Arabic word, of course, and Descartes made all these innovations in that domain. So. And of course, the ontological argument, which played a very big role in rationalism goes all the way back to Anselm soon after the Norman conquest. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the theistic arguments, I think, and, and as you said, Alex was saying, mathematical uh, application to these things does go back a long way and is probably quite widespread. So I thought maybe we could um, move to discussion of uh, Hume and the critique of the distinction a bit. Um, would you like to start us off, Crystal, by maybe how um, the rationalism and empiricism distinction, why we should be moving away from it? Okay, I mean, I feel like I've already sketched a lot of that by just saying it introduces a lot of biases into our understanding 
of the early modern period. Um, I mean, basically, I think we all agree, the, um, if we take the empiricist rationalist distinction seriously, it just gets the history wrong. Um, it, it tells us that, that the only people, um, well, that, that, you know, um, that what we've got, we've got Hume building on Locke, who's building on, uh, you know, um, on Bacon, and that's it. And they're not talking to people on the other side of the division, and as, as Peter's already pointed out. Um, actually, they've got, a lot of those people have got a lot more in common with, well, a lot of the people we call empiricists have got a lot more in common with the people we're calling rationalists than is suggested by this. Um, I mean, so the project I've been working on um, has been to, uh, with the Otago School in New Zealand, was to, um, to suggest that there is a different way of carving up the early modern period. And so maybe that's a way of kind of explaining what's wrong with the empiricist rationalist distinction. That's what I should have asked you. Where, where should we go next? How do we change the game? Right. I mean, and, 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 I'll, and so I, I'm, I'm actually sort of more of a pluralist about these kinds of frameworks. I think that different... That, that, that it's quite useful to have different ways of carving up these periods, and um, as long as we're aware of what these different frameworks do. So, um, so we've argued that, um, that there's a different distinction that's at work, especially in, in Britain um, in the late 17th century, that does a lot of work, um, and that's the distinction between um, experimental philosophy and speculative philosophy. So the idea there is that uh, around 1650, um, a lot of people, uh, largely um, bro brought together by Boyle, Robert Boyle, um, start reading uh, some of Bacon's work, and, um, and they become very interested in what they call the new philosophy. They're, they're, kind, of, um, they're kind of railing against scholasticism, uh, which they characterise as the speculative philosophy. And so they decide that they are becoming the, the new experimentalists, or the new experimental philosophy is there. And, and it's, so it's very much based on uh, Bacon's work, where he says, he says we should start from um, observation and experiment. We should um, carry out careful, systematic experiments and kind of carefully uh, build up uh, kind of tables of facts and so on. And, and eventually, when we've kind of got, got all of the facts on the table, then we should start theorizing about these things. Um, and, and so this looks like a hugely influential view of... Um, a hugely influential methodology. Um, and so we've argued that, that, that in fact the kind of main, major terms, the major distinction that people were drawing in Britain around this time was this distinction between speculative philosophy and experimental philosophy. We find the experimental philosophers are people like um, what, Locke, Berkeley, Newton. Um, so suddenly we were able to bring in different players than before. So instead of just focusing in Britain on uh, you know, Locke, Barclay, Hume, we can talk about people like Boyle, um, Margaret Cavendish, who's kind of a self-declared speculative philosopher around this time. Are there um, many others? Because my guess, would, <laughs> my guess would be that lots of them would want to identify as experimental, but rather few might want to identify as speculative, which is sometimes used as a sort of insult, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And, and actually, to be fair, you don't find very many. Um, Margaret Cavendish is one of the very, is one of the only ones who kind of explicitly self-declares as a, as a speculative philosopher. Um, you know, she kind of rails against us, um, a, a, against people using um, microscopes to learn about the world and things like this. She doesn't think that they give you kind of a true picture of, um, of, of the things that are important to, human, to, to, to the human uh, position in the world. Um, and so, yeah, so, so, I, so speculative philosophy isn't really an empty category, and it's certainly, um, and so there are people who declare that way, but really the people who, in, 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 say, 1660, the people who are the speculative philosophers are the scholastics. And so they're, they're kind of, um, they're dividing, they're, they're carving themselves off from the previous generation of thinkers, is more the idea. They're railing against the schoolmen and things like that. Um, as the... As, as, as the late 17th century progresses, and especially, I think, when, when Newton comes into the picture and with his successes, suddenly Descartes becomes labelled a speculative philosopher. And, of course, that's not a label that he'd be very happy with. But, um, but for various reasons, they think that this is the right way to be thinking about him. Um, and so we think that this, this, that this division does a lot more work. Um, than the empiricist rationalist distinction does uh, for, for, how to, for how to understand um, the kinds of developments that happened in the early modern period. Um, it's mostly because, so the rationalist, so, so where the rationalist empiricist distinction is a 
they're talking about epistemology, so we're interested in kind of the nature of first person knowledge. Um, the experimental speculative distinction, um, it's a methodological distinction. So um, in the early days, it's largely driven by, by kind of natural philosophy. Um, how, what is the best way of learning about the natural world? Um, and, and, you know, with, especially once Newton comes along um, and, you know, his hugely successful work on understanding celestial motion and understanding optics and things like this, um, this methodology really starts to take off and people try to apply it in other places too. And so you find, you, you then find people like, like Hume trying to be, um, try, trying to be kind of um, experimental moral philosophers and things like this. And so you find them trying to pick up these kinds of methods. And so you get this picture where, um, where philosophical development is very much driven by uh, scientific achievement, uh, technological development, and, and the kinds of challenges um, that, that things like this new world view present um, in other areas of philosophy and so on. So you get a very different kind of picture of um, what are the kind of key uh, keys to progress in, in this kind of period. Um, Hume talks about experimental yeah, the, philosophy. The, Do you think it's the same kind of thought here? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, uh, as Kirsten was saying, I mean, Newton was hugely influential. I mean, he, the, the Principia uh, was an, an absolutely magnificent work. And, of course, it was very, very highly mathematical. Um, but at the same time, saying that he didn't want to... Uh, feign hypotheses, he's basing it on experimental work. And in the wake of uh, Newton, uh, lots of people want to follow the same pattern, as Kirsten said. And Hume, when he comes out with his uh, Treatise of Human Nature, his, his great work, 1739-40, uh, its subtitle is an, an attempt to introduce the experimental method of reasoning into moral subjects. So that's what he wants to do. So. He's often thought of as styling himself sort of Newton of the mind. Um, so I, I, I agree with Kirsten that I, that I think that the philosophy over this period is far better understood in the light of the development of science rather than some sort of caricature that the rationalists are trying to prove everything a priori, you know, starting with the ontological argument and so on. There's a, there's a you know, little bit of truth in that, but actually, um, the big difference between Descartes and Newton, I would say, is that Newton's theory worked and Descartes didn't. And uh, that's probably why we know of Newton as a physicist and Descartes as a philosopher. I mean, Descartes had this lovely theory for explaining how the planets move around the sun and the moon moves around the earth. It's all in terms of vortices and... It has to be in terms of vortices because by examining our innate idea of extension, we can see that the universe has to be a plenum, absolutely full, which means that any movement has to go, like in a soup tureen, you know, if you stir it, push it in that direction, there has to be a vortex. That's what keeps the planets near the sun. And then, and, you, and then Newton swiftly you, demolishes it you, in book two of the Principia. Absolutely. Yeah. Since, since my hackles have been raised here, <laughs> uh, let, me, let me just point out that on that point, the point about whether um, uh, space is absolute or relative, uh, oh. I feel like Descartes kind of has the upper hand. No, uh, well, no, it's whether that, space... That's one of the few things that has been... Uh, it's whether space is a plenum. Is a plenum, yeah. But, yeah, but, 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 the tr but then it turns out from... Kepler and so on, that, that, that the planets move in ellipses, and Newton in Principia makes a point of proving that a vortex can't give rise to an ellipse. Yes, yeah. Yeah. All the things about motion and force and having mass in your system, I, I, I will concede to Newton. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh. But I do wonder, you know, had it turned out that Descartes' theory of physics matched the heavens, the, the whole story might have been very different. Yeah, it might have been. I mean, it didn't stop the on the continent, it didn't stop them from trying to kind of, no. um, to take Newton's mathematical results and to try and kind of underlay a, a Cartesian worldview underneath it or a Cartesian metaphysics. So yeah, they certainly did keep trying.
Well, there was hostility there, wasn't there? I know, over the, even over the calculus results, that because the Newtonians stuck to Newton's notations and they, oh, yeah. even after yeah. Leibniz, so they weren't really speaking to each other anymore, those scientific yeah. communities. So there was all that Newton-Leibniz thing, which was very unfortunate. Yeah. 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 Newton was not a particularly nice guy. Great no. scientist. <laughs> but you also find... Leibniz I mean, is lovely. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Leibniz. Um, but, but you also do find even the very way that, that Newtonian physics develops in Britain and on the continent, it really... It, it, it's very different in these two places because in Britain they kind of take Newton at his word that we don't need to worry about, like, you know, there's this kind of empty space underlying it all. Um, and so they, they sort of set about... Um, sort of developing Newton's theory by trying to find new planets and, you know, new celestial bodies uh, to kind of uh, make, make the mathematics work. Whereas on the continent, um, they set about trying to kind of correct the mathematics itself by thinking about vortices underlying it. So, in fact, the two theories by the end of the kind of 18th century, the two, the two theories look very, very different to how, you know, to how they started. Can I throw something else? Um, I, the, um, I guess, I mean, in addition to, I, I very much agree that this methodological story is much more interesting and fruitful than the kind of epistemological story about this distinction. I guess there's also this narrative that maybe is due to Kant. I realise I didn't really answer the Kant question, so this is um, um, partly penitent. Um, the, there's, there's also this question of whether there's any sense in discussing how the world might be in itself as opposed to how it just looks to us. Um, so, you know, all, all the scientific research that's going on in the time is presumably gathering more and more information about how things appear to be. And then there's this question of, well, you know, that, that's interesting, but how, how are things actually like? Could the world be very, very different from how it appears to be, even to our best instruments? Even, you know... Uh, testing things against our best experimental methods. And the rationalists are sometimes uh, grouped together as the people who thought, yes, the world is very, very different from how it appears to be. You know, Spinoza thinks, although we experience the world existing in time, in fact, time is unreal. It's a pretty big difference between appearance and reality. You know, Leibniz thinks material bodies aren't real. It looks like they're material bodies, but they're not really there. Well, how do we know? How can we know something like that? Well, because we have this other faculty, which isn't just a faculty for detecting appearances, which isn't just you know, a sensory faculty, which can somehow penetrate beyond what's presented to our senses. I mean, Kant is interesting in that regard because he keeps the rationalist distinction. He says, yes, there is a difference between how things appear to us and how things are in themselves, because we can't know anything about how things are in themselves. That's what everybody knows about Kant. That's Kant in the first critique of pure reason. Um, but then, much later, he writes to his friend Fichte. Uh, Fichte says, why, why do you keep talking about things in themselves if you say we can't know anything about them? And Kant says, I, I say we can't know anything about them, but we think about them all the time. And it's interesting just to talk about how we think about them. So in, in that sense, he almost becomes a rationalist again. So he's no longer saying that we have intellectual intuitions that tell us about how things are in themselves. But we certainly have thoughts about them, and these thoughts are worth talking about. And so the, the philosophers who follow Kant in the German idealist tradition kind of begin a new sort of version of rationalism, where, okay, let's, let's talk about how we think things in themselves actually are, beyond the mere appearances of things. That's, that's interesting, but are, are you suggesting that the empiricists uh, don't draw a distinction between how things appear and how they are in themselves? I no, mean, no, no, I'm, I'm making a different distinction here. I mean, whether, empiricists versus non-empiricists... Uh, versus rationalists, I guess, we've, we've all agreed in rejecting. But I guess that it is interesting, in terms of where you're going to situate science with relation to philosophy, whether you think the world is, for some reason, going to be pretty much how it appears to be, in which case natural science is the best you can do to work out how things actually are, or whether you think the world might be completely different from how it appears to be, in which case natural science can tell you something, how things look to us, right. but you might have a better method, another method, for working out how things actually are. Okay, so, so you, you'd include Locke, say, as someone who, who thinks that things as they are in themselves are somewhat similar to the way they appear. Modulo, primary, secondary, quality, distinction, ignorance of what substance is, but it's not radically different. Yeah, not as yeah. different as, say, Spinoza or yeah. Leibniz's okay. vision. Thank you.
Okay, might be a good time for some more questions. I know you had a lot. Just in the picture, jump around the front row. Um, question on the language. Um, you so language is a rational, at least logical system that we have to know about the world. What, where does language fit into that discussion? Okay, thank you. And then just in the purple. So I'm interested in um, the role that this plays as a kind of foundation myth for philosophy these days. So you all done a very nice sort of hatchet job of this way of understanding early modern period. But nonetheless, when someone says, how do we think about knowledge? Well, people often start out by thinking about versus rationalism. And so I wonder if you want to comment on the ways in which those categories have kind of shaped the way that people do epistemology now, and maybe how it could be different. Okay, and then one more here. I'm looking. Thanks. Uh, I was wondering if you could say something about the way when we think of reason outside of maybe more outside of philosophical context, you think of it more about sort of like a you know, logic or a kind of certain way of thinking about things you know, systematically. So I was wondering, taking that into account, are there any philosophers who are defending unreason or irrationality? So not having that the opposite of it rather than empiricism. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so one on language and its role, um, one on the hatchet job done by the categories and how they impose themselves on the history of philosophy, and one on defenders of non-rational philosophy. So uh, la language obviously it, it, plays a big role here in that um, if you think that uh, we have concepts that are innate, you, you will think naturally enough that some of our language maps onto those concepts. Uh, if, on the other hand, you think that all of our concepts come from experience, then that is going to affect how they should be interpreted. So, I mean, Locke puts a lot of effort into explaining how all our concepts can come from experience. Uh, Hume then follows him up and uses that as a tool of analysis. He says, right, in order to understand what we mean by you know, cause, person, uh, material substances, whatever, it, it, and some of these things he's going to question whether we do actually have a coherent understanding of them. But his way of following that through is to say, where are the impressions from which these ideas are copied? Where in sense experience or feeling uh, do we get those concepts? And he applies the same to you know, morality and aesthetic judgment. And so in those areas, actually, he comes to the conclusion that uh, our moral ideas actually come to a large extent from inside us, from our own feelings, our own general approval or aesthetic delight. Um, so th and that feeds through into a lot of contemporary philosophy, actually. Uh, people like Simon Blackburn, uh, who, who wants to take what he calls a, a quasi-realist uh, view, where actually some of our judgments are projected onto the world. We kind of construct a reality or a quasi-reality of morality or aesthetics, and, and that's ultimately tracing its way back uh, to Hume's analysis, which was couched in terms of the origin of our ideas and therefore of our language. Okay, and um, take on. Yeah, I, um, I thought I'd say something about unreason, because I think that's interesting. <laughs> um, I mean, again, I think, I think one useful question about knowledge, it's maybe a bit on your question as well, um, you know, if you have some reason to assume that the world is how it appears to be, then you're going to think that you can get knowledge about the world as it really is through empirical methods of some sort. If you don't think that, you, you know, you're either going to be completely sceptical or you're going to think that, imagine that there's some other way you can know about reality beyond appearance. I think reason is sometimes, you know, people talk about reason as being the alternative. I think that's actually a bad choice. You know, reason, reasoning really is, is usually just used to mean um, a way of drawing one valid inference, to, you know, drawing valid inferences from certain premises. Uh, I guess German philosophers in the 19th century used reason for as, as the term for this magical faculty, almost magical, you know, this, this non-sensory faculty that allows us to penetrate beyond the appearances of things. But there are people like um, someone I'm interested in, uh, F.H. Bradley, early 20th century British philosopher 
who thinks that reason is also not going to allow you to understand what things are really like, because he thinks that the concepts that we use to try to describe the world are themselves incoherent. We generally describe the world as consisting of various objects with various properties, but he thinks the concept of object and property for you know, these complicated arguments are actually uh, incoherent concepts. So all you have is, is, he says, some sort of something akin to mystical intuition. That's the best you can do. And sort of non-concept driven thought is the best you can do to try to grasp what things are really like. Um, so, you know, there are traditions like that in, in the history of philosophy as well. I just wanted to try and move us through to some more contemporary material. Um, so there's a way of, sort of, way in which rhetoric around reason in public discourse and in philosophical thought has come back to the fore uh, in certain, I suppose, more popular philosophy figures at the moment. I was wondering, Alex, if you could say a bit about the perception of some of those debates. Um, yeah, well, I subjected myself to um, one of Stefan Molyneux's books um, for reasons <laughs> I won't go into. Um, <laughs> people found it on my computer, I have to say, it's only there for research purposes. Um, <laughs> But uh, here's this book called The Argument. Um, I mean, it doesn't matter if you don't know who he is. I, I don't even think you should necessarily go and find out. But he, he uses this notion of rationality as a kind of political tool for endorsing uh, a, a certain sort of ideological picture. So he has this, this position that... Reason is the basis of civilization. Reason is the foundation of civilization. And reason for him means using arguments to convince each other to do stuff rather than anything else, rather than appealing to emotion, rather than uh, resorting to coercion and things like that. So one of his examples is, um, he says, a woman who pouts and sulks when her husband doesn't do what she wants. All his examples are gendered in a very deliberate way, by the way. Um, you know, he isn't using reason, she's using some sort of coercion because she's using the, the pouting and sulking as, as a kind of coercive punishment, you know, a threat. And I guess my first thought is, well, well I mean, f forget the, the you know, um, clear agenda behind his examples, but you kind of think, why? Why is it better, in every case, to use arguments to try to move somebody to, to change the way they do things? Um, if Marley's ghost had appeared to Scrooge and made a series of rational arguments in favour of distributing wealth. Um, why, would that, why would that have been better? You know, assuming it was equally effective, why would that have been better than appealing to his sentimentality, um, to his emotions? That's one thought I had about that. Um, but the other thought I had is, you know, I don't really believe in this distinction between affective and cognitive states, states that are emotional, mental states that are emotional, and mental states that are you know, cognitive, purely sort of thought-based. I think, you know, we don't really have thoughts or feelings. Everything we have is kind of in between a thought and a feeling. To be convinced by a rational argument is to have a certain sort of emotional experience. It's one reason people enjoy doing philosophy, right? So, um, what people who endorse this kind of rationalist program, that sort of rationalist program, what do they mean? I can only think that they mean if somebody, in the course of an argument, uh, keeps their cool, you know, doesn't show a lot of emotion, doesn't sort of get angry or, you know, become too kind of tub-thumping rhetorical or doesn't cry. Upset, yeah. Um, upset, then, you know, they're for some reason doing something that's superior, you know, that, that, we, that we should respect more than a person who does the opposite. Again, I, I don't see any reason for that. I mean, I, I don't see what the argument is that, that that's necessarily better. But also, I think it serves a political agenda in the sense that if you're having an argument against a political topic which involves one minority group being oppressed and a majority group doing the oppressing, um, of course, the person more likely to be upset in the course of the argument is the person belonging to the minority group. So it serves this agenda, you know, you the same thing with people like Jordan Peterson saying, well, you know, I'm not the one getting angry, I'm not getting angry, you know, and so it's, yeah, that's because <laughs> you're not the one suffering from any of the, um, you know, the injustices that you're, you, can, you can so passion, dispassionately discuss. Um, so, yeah. Could I just, sure. So, yeah, I mean, that's very interesting. Um, you, you won't be surprised, Alex, that 
I'm rather more sympathetic to the distinction between affective and cognitive, mm. knowing I'm a fan of Hume and um, fact value distinction and all that. Um, I, I mean, I do think, for example, uh, that artificial intelligence uh, is a possibility, not, not as something that thinks like us or feels, but I don't see why you shouldn't have an AI system that is very good at judging the validity of arguments in a particular area. And that wouldn't involve having any particular kind of feeling. Um, it doesn't seem to me that you necessarily, any particular kind of feeling has to accompany recognising an argument as a good one or a bad one. Um, I've looked at, at some of these people, I mean Molyneux and uh, Peterson, a guy called Ben Shapiro, that not actually come across them much before, but recently, knowing that they might come up today. I mean, I think there's, there are things going on at the moment uh, which make this particularly topical, and I actually, well, I may be disagreeing with you here, I'm not sure. Regarding the political agenda, I mean, we live in a time where... Um, there is a lot of aggression out there, a lot of tribalism. And in our universities, there is now quite a lot of movement to shut people down without allowing them to speak. And a lot of that is actually done in the name of supporting oppressed minorities. And I think when the... the, the that's unfortunate because it actually gives right-wingers who want to say, look, we're standing up for reason. It actually puts them in the role of the good guys. And I think it is better to use argument than to shout. I argument in the sense of rational argument. And I think the, the kinds of things... Can you shout a rational argument? Sorry? It, 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 can't you shout a rational argument? Wouldn't it just be rational but louder? Well, well I think, I think when, you, when you have the spectacle of um, academics coming to talk at other universities and they end up being surrounded by lots of rather aggressive, even violent students who want to stop them speaking. I don't think this is a good way to, for society to be. I think our universities uh, should be um, bastions of, 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 of free speech, unless, I mean, within the law, within the law, not, not inciting violence and so forth. And the trouble is, I, I think these guys, you know, there are, there are fundamental things wrong with the, the, the basis of these guys' political philosophy. But if we just shout them down, we, we don't expose that. I'm not sure, so, I mean, I'm, I'm just not sure where rationality fits into to all those arguments. I, mean, I, I agree that with most of what you say, that people should be free to discuss things. But I think people should be free to discuss things in whatever mode they want. I mean, if you want to make an impassioned sure. emotional plea... No, I completely um, agree with that. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. Um, and so, there may be so, times when that's actually more appropriate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But so I think that the way the, these kinds of characters use reason is, uh, uh, you know, slightly disingenuous, maybe even manipulative, because the, the you know, they, they're conflating two different things. One is the question of, well... Uh, what sorts of you know, modes of speech are we permitting? And the other is the question of should we listen to various points of view? Um, but by sort of slipping those together, they kind of end up being able to... But I think it, it, it's quite unfortunate for society if people get into the habit of questioning the motives of other people rather than addressing their arguments. If you say, you're only saying that because mm -hmm. claiming to know other people's psychology... I mean, I, th I think... Given the, I mean, the way the world is now, the, what we, we've seen this in, in Britain and America, I mean, democracy is in serious trouble. And part of the reason it's in serious trouble, I think, is this kind of tribalism. And I, I do feel very sorry that values of the Enlightenment are being challenged and lost. And, and I think it's a, a serious mistake on the left, a very, very serious mistake on the left, because it gives the false impression that the right have the best arguments. And, you know, so you get people... I mean, uh, I've noticed particularly 
appeal to the views of Ayn Rand, who seems to be you know, quite popular, including with our new Home Secretary. Now, I actually think her views are, are, are fundamentally objectionable in various ways. But uh, on intellectual grounds, there are things wrong with them. The arguments she uses for, for the fundamentals are pretty poor. But on the other hand, these guys have a logical structure built on that which is kind of self-consistent and gives them an answer to any argument that's brought. So they can sit there looking very calm and presenting that structure. But nobody's saying, well, hang on a second, let's go to the foundations of this. Look, let's look at your theory of morals, your theory of property. Those are actually questionable. Um, now let's see you defend them. Um, so, you know, I, th I, do, I do think the... the the heat of the debate is casting them in a better light than, than their theories deserve. It would be interesting to know what you Yeah, I think it would be a good time to take the questions now. Uh, okay, one here in front. It's quite interesting hearing uh, uh, Peter Milliken's remarks just now because it ties in with the lecture that was given last week um, here uh, by... Um, I'll, I think her name was uh, Elizabeth Anderson from the University of Michigan, in which she showed how the liberal enlightened, uh, I'm sorry, the liberal thinking of the Enlightenment, people like Adam Smith and John Stuart Mills, has was hijacked at a later period by, well, the 20th century, by the neoliberals, which actually reversed and turned upside down the very basis and the, and the foundations on which liberalism and empiricism was, were built, and, um, which just shows how things can be manipulated, can I say. But just having a slight word with, uh, on Alexander Douglas' point about rationality, the trouble is, uh, I think that's what we're seeing now with this uh, uh, rebuttal of the Enlightenment values, and that if you um, jettison rationality and logic and, and all the traditionally British uh, values. What you're left with is what we're getting now with a post-truth, post-rational uh, milieu, which um, just seems to dispense with um, a, a framework, a format in which things can be uh, reach by consensus and, and so you're the tribalism. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll just add like four and then we'll round out the end with discussion of them from here. One here, the one there. Uh, I was wondering what you might think about the connection which some scholars sometimes draw between the the types of the dichotomy between the two schools of thought, the empiricists and the rationalists and the two uh, the and the dichotomy between the two major ideologies of the Okay, thank you so much. I'm just, just here. Right. I found that really interesting that I'm right. Um, could you explain exactly which parts of her argument are the most flawed? And how <laughs> <laughs> on, on RAN? Yeah. Okay. 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 okay, I'm forward to that. And then just one minute or so. Yes, I'm thinking that another famous dichotomy uh, is the one between the Vita Contemplativa and Vita Activa from the Greeks. Uh, I was wondering if that dichotomy has had an influence in the empiricist versus rationalist dichotomy. In this second issue, fast forward a few centuries uh, to, to the 20th uh, century, with the rise of analytical philosophy, and has such rise meant the demise of empiricism and the indication of Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Hi. Can I say something um, about, so it's, it's partly in, in response to, to what Peter was saying earlier, but also I think in response to this question. So I find it very confusing when people say that um, the value of rationality is being lost in our society. And it's because I don't understand how the word reason is being used there. So there's reason in the sense of the faculty of drawing logical inferences. That I understand. So if you believe both A and B are true, then it's reasonable to believe that A is true. Because that's logically entailed by your first belief. Um, but you can hold the weirdest views in the world without running afoul of logical consistency. 
In fact, even if you hold a bunch of crazy views that have nothing to do with each other, well, as long as their logical form is just P, you know, one big sentence, then that's perfectly logically valid, right? Um, even if you, you, you infer the whole set of beliefs from itself, that's a valid logical inference, P, if and only if P. So, um, you can even hold inconsistent You can even hold inconsistent beliefs, and that, yes, whatever there's, conclusion there's, you want. there's no problem, right, yeah, exactly. Just have, get, get one contradiction in there, unless you've got a pair of consistent logic. So, so I'm not sure what people um, mean by invoking rationality. There's some other sense, I guess, that there are like things that we ought to believe, things that it's sensible to believe, things that it is in some way you know, unpleasant not to believe. But I'm not sure that rationality is the right word for characterising that. That's all wrong. Um, I mean, rationality is about how you get from one belief to another, not about um, the, the quality of the beliefs. Oh, I don't agree. Oh, OK. No, no. <laughs> no I, I, I don't think uh, that somebody who thought they were a pumpkin, however consistent their beliefs were with that, I, I don't think you'd say they're rational. Um, what if they inferred it from the premise I'm a pumpkin? No, no uh, you're, you're applying the word ra reason purely in terms of inference, and I, I, I mean, I agree that's a perfectly good use of the term, but the word, the word reason has quite a number of meanings, yes. and I think when people talk about the reason being lost or the value of you know, the enlightenment focus on reason, they're meaning things like uh, critical analysis, polite discussion, uh, examination of premises, as well as, I mean, you know, that's where I question about Rand, I mean that's where I would go to Rand, I'd, I'd look at the premises and, and where she gets the logical framework fr from um, I mean w she puts a lot of emphasis on life, she says without life there is no value that's kind of plausible right, if there were no living things in the universe there would be no value in it, fairly plausible, uh, therefore we all act primarily to keep our own life. No, that's not true. That's biologically false, right? I mean, things evolve to try to be uh, biologically, reproductively successful, um, and part of that can be uh, parents giving themselves up for their children. Uh, or not, I'm not just talking about humans here. You know, so I think it, it's kind of a bit biologically illiterate. She sort of starts from life being a prerequisite to value and therefore we should all uh, care most about our own lives. I think there's an element of psychological egoism in there. Uh, the idea that somehow the only rational thing to care about is oneself. I think that's just false. Um, refuted by Bishop Butler years ago. Um, with regard to property, uh, she wants to say that uh, we all have a right to the product of our own labour. Value comes from effort, so if we put effort into something, we kind of ought to own that. Um, and she takes that to an absolute level, and it, it doesn't seem to me to be obviously and unquestionably true. If we live in a society where we've got some strong, we've got some weak, we have infants, we need to have a need for education and all that kind of thing. Um, the idea that we can treat property on just an individual level and ought to seems to me extremely questionable. I mean, there's a, there's a lot else I could... I mean, now's not the time to get into that, and I'm, ha I'm happy to post something on a blog if there's a blog there where I can post something. But, I, I mean, basically, it, it, it seems to me that... the, the one can apply the question of rationality not only to drawing inferences from one's premises, but whether the premises seem to be well-based, um, theoretically or empirically. Chris, I wonder, do you, in having looked at the empiricist and rationalist distinction and having a sense of a bit, perhaps better way to look back at it, do you see connections between the more ancient traditions or indeed the sort of... Um, conservative versus liberal dichotomy that we tend to call up politics? Gosh, I don't know. Um, I, mean, I mean, one of the things that sort of comes out of, I think, my work is that, um, I mean, actually this harks back to one of the earlier questions that we had about um, what these foundation myths do to shape current philosophy. Um, and I think that if we sort of take something like the empiricist rationalist distinction 
seriously that this gives us them, then, then, and this tells us that we're doing the right thing and thinking that, um, you know, metaphysics and epistemology are kind of the core philosophical disciplines, and so we should be thinking about reason and, and so on in these kind of first person, um, you know, true justified belief type ways. But if we take, say, the story, the narrative where science plays a much more central role in, in driving philosophical progress in the early modern period, if we take that to its, to, you know, if we take that seriously and see what that means for kind of present day philosophy, it means that we should be paying much more attention to things like uh, what's going on in philosophy of science and so on. And in philosophy of science, people are much more concerned at the moment with things like um, social epistemology and um, and trying to uh, and taking things like science and good argument in science and so on as being much more uh, driving towards um, the epistemic virtue of understanding rather than the epistemic virtue of something like truth. Um, and so I suspect that um, that this might have repercussions for how we should be thinking about, say. Um, uh, the kinds of arguments that people like Ayn Rand and people like that are putting forward, or even some of our politicians and so on, um, that maybe we should think about these kind of exchanges, exchanges of ideas to be uh, ideally driving towards kind of um, understanding both positions rather than trying to aim at something like truth, which is what, and, and I think we run into problems when we try and attack someone, some, some, some of these kind of, I guess we might call them post-truthers, if we try and attack them uh, by saying, no, you know, you're starting from faulty premises, they don't care about that. They care about the kind of um, the deeper truth or something that, or that, that they think is kind of, um, that they're kind of uh, getting through their argument or something like this. And, and so if we try and attack just the premises of those arguments, we're not going to get anywhere. Um, but if we sort of try and point out that, that there's some sort of failure of understanding more broadly, um, then that might be a better way. Just, yeah, sure. I, if only two or three minutes left, so final thoughts would be great. Okay. Yeah. All right, shall I? Well, I'll take off from that. Yeah, I mean, the, with regard to people like Shapiro, of course, they're not saying they're post truthers at all. They're, they're claiming to be basing their, their views on, on rational thinking. So I think challenging their premises is, is, is very effective. And um, w one thing about liberalism and socialism, that, that question came up. It doesn't seem to me that. Uh, a rationalist or empiricist approach need necessarily push you in a particular political direction. I mean, it, it, it is in fact true that uh, Locke is something or has become something of a, a, a poster boy for the right in America, but I don't think he would have been thought uh, hugely right-wing at the time. Hume, Hume was thought of as uh, conservative, and in some ways he is conservative. He's, he's sceptical. He doesn't believe in revolution. On the other hand, Hume's analysis of property, for example, as an artificial virtue, as something that is socially constructed, that we, that therefore needs to be designed with the uh, general moral considerations in mind. It's not, as it were, a natural category in things. That is absolutely antithetical to the kind of view that Rand is taking. So it can be used as a, uh, as a critique there. So um, maybe I'll stop there. Yeah, I mean, I guess just no, no, to stress this point, I suppose it, it, it's important that there are different meanings of reason, I guess. It's, it's something we should all take up from this. So, I mean, I guess a, a really simple, important lesson is you can say uh, my beliefs are reasonable in the sense that I'm justified in holding them. You can say my beliefs are reasonable in the sense that they you know, follow the laws of logic. You can say my beliefs are reasonable meaning the way I'm expressing them is kind of, you know, sufficiently genial. But it's a fallacy of equivocation to think that if somebody's beliefs are reasonable in one of the last two senses, they're therefore reasonable in the first. And I think people trade a lot on that fallacy of equivocation, and that's unreasonable. <laughs> okay, so I think on that note, uh, we'll end it. I just want to say thank you very much to the audience for coming along, and thank you very much to the speakers.